everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again for our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we say thank you. Thank you once again for bringing us together. I pray that as we study, wherever is being, whenever and wherever, uh, your word go forth. We pray that hearts and minds will be open to receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again, we are happy that you chose to join us on our Mount Sinai, uh, well, the Mount Sinai NBC of Memphis YouTube channel. And we're always happy when you choose to join us. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button right underneath uh, this YouTube message. And that way, whenever a new uh, Bible study lesson goes out, you'll get notifications. So we're studying article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship in the gospel observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And so our scripture, if you recall, has been coming from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. But today, we will only read verses 10 through 13 out of the NIV version. And it reads, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there will be no division among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? So if you recall, we started this study of the church at Corinth by giving some background of the city and the church. Uh, the city of Corinth was a major metropolis in the Roman Empire, which means that people from all over the Mediterranean world came together in Corinth. Because of its location, Corinth was central to the trading world. It received heavy traffic by land and by sea, which made it a perfect place for the gospel to be introduced. Paul's norm was to set up churches in places that would reach the most people, and Corinth was just that. It was a city on the move, <coughs> excuse me, and it was a melting pot of different cultures. There were mostly a mix of Jews, Greeks, Romans, and Orientals, and they all brought different lifestyles, values, cultures, religious beliefs, and even their own little gods. And because of this diversity, <clears throat> over the years, Corinth, the city, became known for its widespread of prostitution. There were temples dedicated to Aphrodite, uh, Neptune and other gods that were a huge part of their culture. So supposedly there were thousands of prostitutes that served at different temples and in fact the Corinthians incorporated sex with their temple slaves slash prostitutes as part of their worship service. The culture was outlandish. That <clears throat> the culture was so outlandish that around the then world, people began to nickname loose women as Corinthian women. And the common slang when wanting to party without boundaries was let's get Corinthianized. We can summarize by saying that Corinth was a cesspool of immorality. Corinth, as in today's Las Vegas, was considered to be the sin city, the, the capital sin city. It is believed that Paul wrote the letter to the Romans while he was in Corinth. 
I won't read it, but Romans, the first chapter, verses 18 through 32, would probably give you a vivid description of what Paul saw and dealt with on a daily basis while he was in Corinth. It was into this context that one day Paul walked into this city around 51 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, ready to introduce the gospel to a city living in darkness ready to introduce a new religion that most folk had never heard of or had very little understanding of what it was about. And not only that, but this new Christian teaching went against everything they knew about religion. Then, as it does now, the teachings of Christ require a radical change from the norms of society. And as is always the case, when you go against the norms, you are going to face lots of challenges. It was within this context that the Corinthian church was born. Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth to establish the church. After moving on from there, he later received word from Chloe's household and others about different questions and conflicts that the church was having. He wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians, to answer questions and to address the conflicts. And we've said that rather than diving right into the ugliness of the situation, Paul starts the letter by indirectly attacking the problem. He opens his letter by first reminding them of who they are in Christ, thus appealing to their moral and spiritual consciousness. Then, starting in verse 10, he attacks the problem that they are dealing with. The main problem was that of division within the church. I ran across an old uh, Our Daily Bread devotional that zooms in on the problem of division in the Corinthians church uh, and in our church. Uh, whether it be the church of Corinth or our church in our modern day time, it, 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 it still holds true. So it reads, in the 1750s, there was a worldwide conflict known to us as the French-Indian War. The British and French battled for Quebec. Admiral Phipps, commander of the British fleet, was told to anchor outside Quebec. He was given orders to wait for the British land forces to arrive, then support them when they attacked the city. A simple task go, wait, and then support the troops, provide protection while the troops came ashore. Phipps Navy arrived early for the task. As the Admiral waited, he became annoyed by the statues of the saints that adorned the towers of the nearby cathedrals. So he commanded his men to shoot at them with the ship's cannons. No one knows how many rounds were fired or how many statues were knocked down. But when the land forces arrived and the signal was given to attack, the admiral was of no help. He had used all of his ammunition shooting at the statues of the saints. Unbelievable, but true. How would you like to go down in history as the admiral who used up all of his ammunition shooting at something so insignificant as statues of dead saints? But aren't we all guilty? We waste so much energy on that that doesn't make any strides in the kingdom building that when real issues come along, we have no energy to fight. The real enemy in the church is Satan. And if we spend all of our time shooting at insignificant stuff, then when real problems come up, we don't have the energy or the desire. And that was the problem with the Corinthian congregation. They were fighting over things that did not matter, using cannons to destroy each other, while Satan, the true enemy, was controlling the outside and now had gained grounds on the inside. So instead of the church taking ground from Satan, Satan was causing havoc in the church. Even though he, he could never overthrow the church, he could cause their testimony to be ineffective. They were all sitting, they are sitting in a cesspool 
of sin in the city. And rather than winning new converts, they are quarreling about which preacher was better than the other. Verse 11 says that some from Chloe's household have informed me, meaning Paul, that there are quarrels among you. Since Paul only mentioned Chloe's, Chloe's uh, first name, he, he's like on a first name basis with her, uh, and, and doesn't mention any last name or references or anything, I think that means that she must have been well known in the Corinthian church. So, and, and so are the members of her household. It appears that the church probably chose these folk to deliver the letter to Paul to get answers to questions they had. From, from the reading of verse 11, it sounds to me like they delivered the letter and also informed Paul of what was really going on. A letter is good, but firsthand knowledge is priceless. Verse 11 says, My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. The word quarrels means more than a simple disagreement or dispute. It's, it's that point where tempers are so flared up that we just lose it. You, you know, just so mad that you just lose it to the point of being out of control. I would imagine that the conversation between Paul and the members of Chloe's household went something like this. Brother Paul or Pastor Paul. Here's a letter that they sent by that was sent by the church. And then they proceeded to tell him about the mess that was going on in the church. It's like these folk were so angry at one another that they had they were having heated arguments and, and was erupting well, heated arguments were erupting in the congregation. In my mind, I can see them trying to have service and, and somebody would get mad at somebody and somebody would get mad over here and the whole service was just a mess. We've all seen it or at least heard about it. And more times than not, our first response is to take sides, which further separates the congregation. I should point out that these folks we're not arguing about doctoral, uh, doc, doctoral, doctrinal matters. Remember in the previous verses and lessons, we said that they had been enriched in every way and lacked nothing, which drives home 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 2. And this is the NIV version. It says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. These folk who had been enriched with every spiritual gift and with all knowledge, these folk who lacked nothing spiritually, but were lacking in their showing of love. My guess is that because they were so blessed, they had allowed their egos to become too big. Each person thinking they were right and that everybody else was wrong. We know them people. We know those people, right? And hopefully it's not us. And it seems that nobody would take a stand to put an end to the foolishness. Like I said, doctrinal issues were not the problem. Paul gives us specifics in verse 12. He says, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. And another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. The King James Version of those same verses says, Now this is now this I say that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. The church was pledging their allegiance to men rather than Christ. The church was divided because some was pledging their allegiance to Paul, some to Apollos, some to Cephas, and some to Christ, which is hard to believe because if they were pledging to Christ, they would not be a part of the problem. So the question is, how does Paul respond to the egos of the church that is at Corinth? Well, you got to come back next time as we continue with article number 13 
a gospel church. And until then, be blessed, be safe, and come back and join us. Bye-bye.